Over. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the July session of Startup Investing Masterclass with a Thousand Angels. Uh, so excited to be talking to probably one of our largest ever group, groups of attendees today uh, on a really exciting topic, which is what makes a startup deal investable. So thank you so much for joining. We definitely want to keep today's session uh, very interactive. So if you've taken one of my live classes before, you know how it works. You can use the Q&A function or the chat function to submit questions to me to be answered live as we go along today. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone sort of is keeping up with the conversation and we get all of your questions answered, uh, particularly as we get into some more detailed topics. Uh, whether you're an existing longtime 1000 Angels member or a new member or someone who's here just to learn a little bit more about what's involved with early stage investing, I think you'll get a lot out of today's conversation. Uh, so thanks so much for being here. And if you're not yet a 1000 Angels member and you're interested in membership, please be sure to check out our website, 1000angels.com, or shoot me an email directly and we can find some time to chat one on one. So without any further ado, I'd love to get started. I am going to share my screen and we will uh, launch into our part of the program. So today we're going to be talking about investable deals. And, you know, I think this is such an important topic um, because people seem to really struggle with what the critical differentiations are between a great idea, a great business, and a great company and what actually makes it investable, right? So you can have a wonderful idea that maybe doesn't become a great business. You can have a wonderful business that can't necessarily become a bigger company. And you can actually have a really great company, but it's not necessarily investable. So we're going to be looking at opportunities from the perspective of an investor and what would actually um, make something interesting to us from an investment standpoint. So for those of you who have never met me or not participated before, uh, my name is Erica Dagnan Minahan. I am co-founder and managing partner at 1000 Angels as well as Seed Fund Rain Ventures. Uh, I've actually been investing in Seed and Series A for 14 years now. Uh, so 2020 just had my 14 year anniversary uh, through a variety of roles. Um, and during that time, I have invested in hundreds of early stage companies and probably worked with thousands of startups, advising them and guiding them through their capital strategy process. Uh, I did my MBA in finance at Columbia Business School and undergrad at UCLA. Go Bruins. So before we dig into the details, for those of you who are new, I just kind of want to go over what is venture investing, right? And particularly, what is an angel investor? And, you know, why would you even want to become an angel investor, right? Like, why do we do what we're doing and why do we spend so much time educating ourselves uh, about this very active investment role? So very simply put, an angel investor is an individual who makes a direct investment of personal funds into a venture. And it's typically going to be an early stage business. And clearly it's because individuals usually have a little bit less money to invest uh, than say institutions. So usually we're investing in early stage companies, companies that are raising say, you know, less than $5 million total in capital where an individual investor's contribution can actually have a real impact. And of course an angel investor is bringing more to the table than just money. They're probably bringing some expertise, some support, um, some sense of community to the company that they're investing in, but not always, right? So that's an option. Uh, and I just wanna go over the different types of early stage investors. So if we look at this chart, you know, you'll see that the axes go between amount of capital raised, right? So sort of to your left is sort of the lowest, earliest stage amounts of capital towards, you know, larger round. And then we also have an axis that kind of shows you a little bit about deal terms, right? And how much uh, effort goes into structuring and, you know, these things that we'll be discussing today. So, you know, sort of in the lower quadrant, you start off with friends and family round. So, you know, maybe that first 250K of capital, then you get to investment clubs and more professional angels or angel groups. 
uh, seed funds, and then, you know, sort of in the upper right hand corner, you get to be seed firms. And what we do here at 1000 Angels is uh, participate in rounds that are a little bit smaller in size, not the very earliest rounds, uh, but get our individual investors access to deals that are on par with VC firm type assets so that you can actually uh, realize the value of those types of investments. So that's what we'll be talking about today. So why do we even do this? Well, you know, obviously there are plenty of risks and I'm sure you guys are aware of the risks, but we'll talk a little bit about both the risks and the rewards. So, you know, why do people start venture investing when there is a high risk of total loss, you know, a near complete lack of liquidity, and it generally takes about five to 10 years to exit if you're lucky. Well, it's because there are pretty amazing potential rewards and that those include that you are able to earn above market returns. Uh, you're able to meet some really cool people. You know, you might end up with a future billionaire in your portfolio. Uh, you'll definitely learn a lot. And like we're doing today, you're probably gonna have fun. So I think that the rewards uh, hopefully will usually outweigh the risks as long as we invest really intelligently. And we only put money in deals that are truly investable. So, you know, this uh, slide just kind of shows you a little bit of the risk profile of the various asset classes. And I'm not gonna go through them all, but what I do want you to understand is that seed stage equity and venture capital are pretty much the highest risk uh, assets that you can purchase, but they're also uh, potentially the highest return on investment assets you can purchase with potential IRRs of 30% plus uh, on early stage investment rounds. So how, how do we go about reducing risk? Uh, well, one is diversification, right? And another one is co-investing with really strong professional investors. Uh, doing our due diligence, you know, being very engaged with companies and keeping great records. But most importantly, it's taking some of the uh, ideas that we're going to discuss today and making sure that you really apply them to your investment selection to make sure that you're not just investing in great people, not just investing in great ideas, not just investing in great businesses, but that you're actually investing in investable deals. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at. And, you know, clearly this is important because with the range of outcomes of this type of investment, we know that even when a company is investable, probably about 30% of your investment portfolio is going to provide 90% of your investment returns. We want to keep that as disciplined as possible and make sure that, you know, while we roll the dice, we're doing it with the most information um, and using best practices. So getting into the, the meat of today's issue, uh, investable deals. So what makes a deal investable? Well, we have to think about some of the things that drive value in an investment, right? So we'll go through this list. And as you're evaluating an investment, you really need to make sure that you check all these boxes usually quite strongly to make this deal investable. And so the first thing is a strong management team. Um, you know, you've probably heard that people really caution against investing in solo founders. And, you know, this is part of the reason. So to make sure that, you know, the company actually has a management team in place, uh, that's usually at least three lead people, and they don't all have to be co-founders, but they certainly should be um, executive committee. So most companies are going to look for a CEO, a CTO, and um, a COO if it's a very technology-focused company. Or if it's not, you know, a, a highly technology-focused company, you might be looking at a CEO, a CMO, and a COO, or a designer instead of uh, a design lead instead of the CMO. But, you know, those are kind of the roles that you want to have fleshed out, and you want to make sure that the team you're investing in is high quality. Secondly is the size of the addressable market. So the general rule of thumb is that for a company to be investable, the market size, addressable market, really needs to be at least a billion dollars. So this is critical, and this is where I see a lot of people make mistakes. There are plenty of great businesses that are great business opportunities that maybe have an addressable market of 100 million or 200 million. And while that might sound good, it unfortunately really does eliminate the, these, these types of companies from being investable um, 
with early stage venture capital equity. So something to be very thoughtful as you're making your decision. It might be a great business for the founder, but if you're merely putting capital in, it might not be the best investment strategy for you. And then the third thing that I think is so critical, which we're going to dive into a little bit deeper is product market fit. So, you know, I highly caution investors around making investments in companies that have not yet achieved product market fit. Uh, because when you do that, you know, you're really a little bit more in friends and family land. And it's perfectly fine, you know, if you're going into it eyes wide open and you want to take the risk. But before the company has really achieved product market fit, you're very much just betting on the team. And if it's not a team, you know very well, um, you know, you're taking more risk here than you probably want to do, and it will affect your portfolio returns at the end of the day. So to really figure out, you know, how can you work with a founder for them to establish product market fit and to provide you the kind of data that shows that you actually have it. Um, and then next, we're going to be talking a little bit about their customer acquisition channels and, of course, scalability. So scalability goes to also the size of the addressable market. You know, we want to make sure that the, the company has some ability to scale, right? The ability to get large without requiring substantial additional capital investments. Um, and if it does require substantial additional capital investments, you need to be aware of the fact that as an early stage investor, this makes the deal a little bit less investable for you because you will suffer significant dilution and those sub subsequent investors will have a lot of power over the direction of the company and their ownership stake, which doesn't really put you in a position of control. So it makes it a little bit less attractive if it's not capital efficient and scalable in that manner. Um, and of course, you know, understanding the company's competitive advantage. Do they have intellectual property? Do they have, you know, exclusive distribution channels? Why are they better uh, than any newcomer that might come into their market? What are the barriers to entry? Um, you know, do they have a first mover advantage? What's giving them that advantage to really be able to answer that question? Um, and then, you know, we talk a little bit about existing traction needing to be there. Um, you know, we want to see that the company has been able to achieve something. Uh, I always say, you know, startup investing is kind of like looking for people who can spin gold out of straw, right? So even if they haven't raised a lot of money so far, you know, what sort of traction metrics have they been able to achieve and how have they proven to you that there is true potential for growth here? And then lastly, we'll be talking about exit opportunities, which is one of the most overlooked areas when people make an initial investment. Uh, so that will be exciting. So you know, let's dig into management team. So how does management team drive value in an early stage company? So, you know, one of the first things that's gonna drive value is experienced or serial founders. You know, this is not their first rodeo. They know what they're doing um, and they've probably learned some lessons on other people's money, right? So that actually makes it a little bit more attractive and investable to you. Um, as we talked about before, several co-founders is usually better than a solo founder. Uh, just make sure there aren't any, you know, festering ex equity split issues and also that the team uh, is very cohesive and knows how to work together. Like we said, you know, a team in place that has a CEO, COO, CTO, or CMO uh, is great if they have all four bonus, but, you know, usually three is kind of like the sweet spot uh, for this stage of business. And to really understand, you know, do they have the relevant expertise? So you want to ask yourself, you know, why this team, right? Why are they right to do this? I think that, you know, for me, uh, one of the biggest red flags that I see with some of the, you know, founders that I've spoken to, and of course, I've spoken to thousands of potential uh, companies, potential investments is, you know, people who might see an opportunity, but they don't actually have any particular re relevant expertise in the area that they're in. So whenever we make an investment in a company, we really want to understand, you know, why is this person ideally suited to execute on this plan and what is their advantage? Um, and then, of course, you know, the sweat equity that the management team has built so far. And I think this is critical. Uh, you'll see many deals in the market, um, which comprise of people 
who want you to give them money so that they can go out and hire an expert to do the work of building the idea for them. And, you know, I don't really consider that to be something that's investable, right? We are looking to invest in people who have a unique set of skills, you know, that is completely appropriate to what they're trying to do, not somebody who, you know, wants you to give them money so they can go out and hire an app development firm to build the really cool idea that they have in their mind. Um, so we, we consider that critical. And so, you know, moving on to our, our next uh, little box that we have to check, uh, we, we're thinking about addressable market, right? So how does the addressable market uh, drive value? Well, you need to be looking for opportunities that have at least $1 million or more in total addressable market. And why do we need that? Is it because we're greedy? Is it because we're crazy? No, it's because this will dictate how large the company can grow, right? The addressable market is basically kind of the upper limit on, you know, the foreseeable revenue opportunities of the company. And for a company to be acquired, right, to have some sort of an exit, it's pretty much par for the course, you know, not 100% necessary, but it's usually expected that they need to get to somewhere around 100 million or more in revenue is generally where you see these transactions happening. So even if they can get there, right, let's say the market size, you know, addressable market is 200 million and they get to 100 million, you know, it's still not super attractive because nobody wants to acquire something that's not growing, right? So you need to be able to hit that 100 million and still leave room for growth potential after the exit. So if there's a billion dollar market opportunity and the company's gotten to 100 million, whoever's, you know, taking your position out at that point still knows that there is probably, you know, exit uh, opportunity for them to grow their investment by 10x after they buy it for you. So you not only have to generate the growth and return during your course of investment, but when you, you know, it's kind of like the greater fool theory, right? Although hopefully none of these people are fools. These are like, you know, things that are actually going to happen, but that person needs to have an incentive uh, to acquire your equity because there's more growth in the company. So for this reason, a growing total addressable market is preferred. So even if it's maybe not a billion dollar right now, like it could be a new market, you know, a growing market. Um, and, you know, we've seen over the years markets like cannabis, you know, video, uh, meditation, you know, those, these streaming fitness these are types of markets where, you know, maybe they didn't start off huge, but we know that they're growing very fast. And so that makes it uh, even a little bit more investable. So next we want to talk a little bit about product market fit. Um, and why is it so important, but why is it also so misunderstood? And if there's one thing, you know, from our investor perspective that I want you guys to take away from today's conversation is that, you will do a lot better with your investments if you use product market fit as a bar uh, for whether or not to decide a deal is investable. And you know, we'll be sort of going through the deals today as to how to understand whether a company actually has product market fit or not, because people will tell you that they have product market fit and they do not. So the holy grail. The way that we assess product market fit and what most companies do to gather this data is, you know, they'll shoot one of these um, little surveys up to their users while they're, you know, interacting with the technology or in an email. So it's going to ask you, you know, how would you feel if you could no longer use product X? Very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, not disappointment, or, you know, I really don't care at all. I don't even use this thing anymore, right? So if you've ever done one of these surveys, it's because the company is trying to assess their product market fit. And so why it's so critical is that the bar here is quite high. So pretty much almost everybody that you survey needs to be very disappointed. So you can see here a, a app like Slack, which clearly has achieved really good product market fit has about 90% of its users saying that they would be somewhat or very disappointed if they could no longer use the product. So the key question here isn't, you know, do you like this product? Oh, tell us how much you like it. It's how would you feel if you could no longer use it? So what product market fit is generally defined by is do the people feel some pain if they can no longer use your product, right? So you know, I'll give uh, a non-tech example, which I love. I really love In-N-Out. I love In-N-Out Burger. I'm originally from California and, you know, it's my favorite burger place. 
And you know what? They don't have it here on the East Coast. We have Shake Shack. We have McDonald's. You know, we have Five Guys. I don't really love those so much. And so even though there are a lot of substitutes that I can potentially use, I feel very disappointed that I can no longer eat in and out right? So burgers are available to me, uh, but I'm still very disappointed. So that's a great example of product market fit. The person has to not only be disappointed that they cannot have your product, but they also have to not really be okay with simply substituting it. And, you know, there are lots of examples of things that you might really like, you know, um, I love sneakers, you know, I love my Nike running shoes, but you know, if I have to wear Adidas running shoes instead, I don't really notice the difference, right? So, you know, there's not as much pain being generated there. So that's really kind of what we're looking for here is something where if somebody takes it away, the consumer is actually gonna feel pain. And so it's validation that consumers value the product, right? And this establishes the possibility for monetization. So even if the consumer is not paying for the product right now, product market fit is what establishes the possibility for monetization. And if we think about uh, technology products that have, you know, um, achieved very good product market fit pre-monetization. And so people felt that it was okay to bet on them, even though they were not yet making money. You can think about a Facebook or an Instagram, right? So, you know, I don't know how everyone feels in, in today's day and age, but definitely for a while, you know, people were very addicted to their Facebook. They're, you know, people can't live without their Instagram. And even though they're not paying for it, if it was taken away, they would feel some disappointment and or some pain. And so even if the product is not being charged for at the moment or monetized, we know that if people feel pain when it's taken away, that you have an op opportunity to actually monetize that product very well. Um, so if there's no product market fit, the danger here is what's going to happen is the company will take your investment dollars and they will spend it on acquiring new customers. And these customers will simply churn out, right? They're not going to stay with the company because they don't really care about the product. They don't feel any pain if it's not there anymore. So just remember when you make an investment in a company prior to product market fit, there is a very good chance that the company will, you know, be um, enticed into driving growth with new customer acquisition and all of that is just going to fall out of the bottom of the funnel and your money will be wasted. So moving on uh, to the next topic, right? So why do we care about customer acquisition? Well, you know, not only do you have to have product market fit, but you also have to have those customer acquisition channels um, that you can, uh, you know, use to acquire new customers who are also going to love your product. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that the uh, cost of customer acquisition is far less than the customer lifetime value. So the customer lifetime value actually needs to be about 3x the customer customer acquisition. And I apologize, you guys, there was a typo on this slide. So it's three times the cost, cost of customer acquisition has to be less than the customer lifetime value. So if your lifetime value of your customer is about a hundred bucks, you know, you want to be able to acquire that cu customer for say less than $35. So this is not only important in terms of building the business economically, um, but it's also got to be able to be done in a very scalable way, right? So sometimes you'll see new startups who say, we have not spent you know, anything, not even a dollar on customer acquisition, and they've gotten to, I don't know, a thousand customers, 5,000 customers. But for them to kind of go beyond that, they will have to start investing in probably digital customer acquisition channels or a sales team or something that's going to cost money, right? You don't usually just get you know, unlimited, organic, free, viral growth. So to really make sure that the company understands, you know, what is their system for acquiring customers and how much does it cost them and how deep are those pools, right? So, you know, it's not going to cost the same to acquire your first 5,000 customers as your first 50,000 customers. And it's not going to cost the same to acquire your first 500,000 customers as your first 50,000 customers. So for them to really understand what are those channels, how deep are the pools, and what is the exact cost of replicating them. So CAC 
to CLTV. That's customer acquisition cost to customer lifetime value ratio is very important in driving value. So this is essentially what we consider our company's system for making money, right? So if it costs $10 to acquire a customer who'll spend $100 with the company, that company is more valuable than a competitor that spends $50 to acquire the same customer who will spend the same $100, say, assuming they both have the same cost structure. So this is why we always want to understand what is this company's unique strategy for acquiring customers? How are they able to acquire the customer and extract value for them better than everybody else that's out there, right? Because you know, in these digital markets, you're competing with everybody. You're competing with multi-billion dollar companies for, you know, ad spend, for eyeballs. So, you know, what is their sort of unique secret sauce that's allowing to do them to do that? Um, a great example of a company, you know, that was able to uh, get early stage funding and to grow pretty quickly based on something like that is Glossier, which you guys have probably heard of. Uh, the founder actually first, before she launched her brand, you know, built a big online following through her newsletter, right? This was her side hustle. So by the time she was ready to launch the brand, she already had a large captive audience and a brand that's been built. And so that's a great example of why she was able to uh, sort of maximize that, you know, the value of that CAC to LTV ratio because she built a unique channel that didn't really cost very much money with which to acquire customers that was pretty deep and highly scalable. So we want to think that through. Um, and then the next thing I think that you always want to remember to ask uh, versus, you know, just sort of the, the raw numbers is what is the payback period, right? So we're much more interested if a company says, well, it costs me, uh, you know, $25 to acquire this customer and they're going to spend uh, $100 with me over their lifetime. If that $100 is all spent in the first purchase, that's much more valuable than, say, a customer who's going to pay $10 a month and they're expected you know, to retain as a customer for the next 10 months, right? So the shorter the payback period, the more valuable the company is. Now, I think last time we had a little confusion around this issue, which is that I'm not saying that you know, somebody who spends $100 once is more valuable than somebody who spends $10 a month you know, in perpetuity. Uh, but for example, let's say you know, the cost of a subscription product is $100 a year, it would be more valuable for you to sign somebody up to pay $100 up front and you know, maybe it renews the next year versus somebody who pays sort of $10 a month and can cancel at any time, right? So we wanna think about the payback period. We wanna think about how we are financing sort of internally generated cash flows of the business. And this is where you'll see most startups get into trouble, fail, run out of money, is that you know, they're spending $100 to acquire a customer who's on a subscription product that's paying maybe $9.99 a month. So it's going to take them almost a year just to recoup their initial investment. And as they grow, they keep have to laying out more and more cash, uh, which is very expensive for the business to support. So we ideally want it to be recovered on the first sale. That's the best. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but we want to at least be thoughtful about payback period. And then next, you really need to think too about the impact of cost of goods sold or product margins. So if we are spending, you know, $25 to acquire a customer that is spending $100, um, that means that, you know, that margin that we have to play with is about $75. If your cost of goods sold is $75, then it's not a very attractive investment. If your cost of goods sold is, say, $25, then you've got a nice, you know, 50% net margin business. So we don't just want to think about what we spend to acquire and the gross that comes in at that moment, but we really need to think about what we spend to acquire and, you know, the contribution margin that comes in from that sale, right? So when I sell this product, how much cash is it actually contributing into my company? So just remember, shorter payback period is higher value. 
uh, extremely long assumed customer life is lower value. And of course, you know, higher gross margins also means higher value. So those three things are really critical as we're thinking about investability. So we've kind of gone over um, some of the, you know, basic things that we look for in a startup investment from the quality of a company. And now we're going to be sort of digging in a little bit into the math part of it, right? So I would say the previous section kind of de describes a little bit about, you know, uh, the, the good fundamentals for the business. But now we're going to put our investor math hat on and we're going to think about generating returns and how we actually realize the value of our investment. So I'm going to really quickly just make sure we don't have any questions before I move on or anything in the chat. Let me see if I can see that Q&A looks good and chat. Okay, great. So I guess no questions so far. Um, wonderful. All right. So we're back to the screen share. So why exit is everything and really exit is everything. So just remember that every company needs an exit strategy and an exit plan. Every investable company. If the company is not investable, then don't worry about this, right? Not a problem. But for a company to be investable, it needs an exit strategy and an exit plan. And ideally, it should be agreed upon or at least discussed by the founders before the first dollar of investment even goes into the company. And certainly before your first dollar goes into the company, you need to know what the exit strategy is and what the exit plan is and how uh, okay the founders are with doing that. You know, it's sort of a funny story. I had a, a, a person who called me, you know, I think he sent me something in the mail, was asking me for advice. And, you know, as he's doing his investor pitch, the first thing he says is that, you know, he wants to build a business that he can leave as a legacy to his children. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, you lost me there, right? So we're not trying to invest in somebody building a family business, building a legacy for their children. We need these companies to get to exit, right? So, you know, number one, a good idea is not enough, okay? Not, that does not make a company investable. Even a good business is not enough. That does not make a company investable. A great product is still not enough, does not make the company investable. There has to be an opportunity for exit. And that can be through M&A, IPO, or private equity, right? So there are plenty of different ways that we can achieve exit. The company just needs to be suitable for one of those. Um, and then beyond that, really, you know, it's best if we're able to create some sort of an auction situation, right? So if you're like, oh, you know, this company is great. Like, it's very obvious that, you know, I don't know, Zoom is going to buy them, right? And that might be true. But if, you know, as you're contemplating the set of outcomes, there's really only one natural acquirer, that doesn't really put you in a great position either, right? Because if the acquirer knows that they're pretty much the only opportunity that your company has for exit, uh, you're not really gonna get a high price, right? What you really want is to be investing in a company that is so valuable and so attractive that you know, there are probably four or five different companies that are dying to, to acquire them, as well as, you know, a private equity firm that would love to, you know, add them into their portfolio and, and consolidate their industry. Or, you know, they could be really interesting in the IPO markets, right? So we want to make sure that there's more than one exit opportunity uh, so that we can create what we call, you know, an auction scenario rather than a single buyer scenario, which is not good for anybody. Uh, so, you know, the three things that we need to answer, and you don't have to meet all of these, but you need to meet at least one is, you know, number one, can the business create value for other companies? So even if this business is not necessarily going to even get to cash flow positive on their own, if for some reason they're able to create value for a cash rich acquirer, that could be interesting. And you'll see this a lot with, you know, for example, smaller consumer brands, right? So if a consumer brand, uh, you know, is, is started and they're, uh, they have a very authentic voice and they're perhaps reaching a target audience that, you know, Procter Gamble and these big CBG companies can't really figure out how to resonate with. Even though that company may never get to profitability or to high cash flow positive, you know, land, 
they might be able to create a lot of value for those acquirers. And I know lots of companies, particularly in consumer, that are in this position. And they will grow to a billion dollars in revenue, losing money the entire time, you know, and then exit for like, or, or you know, the, sorry, I don't mean like a billion, but they'll make grow to like, you know, several hundred millions of dollars in annual revenue. And then they'll exit for a billion dollars to a large CPG company who can then extract more value for the business that they could not extract because they have different cost structures. So a company can still be investable, even if it's not really planning on making a ton of money or, you know, for example, in technology, a lot of these apps that are given away for free and then they get acquired by a billion dollars for, you know, somebody else who can monetize the technology better. So if it can create value for other companies, that works. Secondly, can the business create high free cash flow, right? So this is more of like the private equity buyer type of question. So, you know, if the business can grow to, you know, $100 million in revenue and it's generating, you know, $50 million in free cash flow annually, that's wonderful. You'll get an exit. They'll be a private equity buyer, right? They'll buy it and they'll just lever that thing up and make a ton of money. So that also works. So that's a very obvious one. Or third, you know, can the business grow large enough to IPO, right? Is there probably an interest from the IPO market? Is this something that can be a standalone company on its own that can actually go public and then you can monetize your shares that way? So those are sort of the three major questions that we need to find a really comforting answer to uh, to consider the company investable. So size matters and do not forget it. Can this business get to around $100 million of annual revenue run rate, right? So that's kind of the bar that we're looking for. Um, and then, you know, is it accretive to potential, potential buyers? So note how that I say accretive here, because as we talked about before, certain businesses might not be earnings positive on their own. But when they're plugged into a larger corporation, they can actually be accretive to earnings because those companies have already got, you know, already huge fixed infrastructure that they're already paying for. And when they plug your business in through those cheaper distribution channels and economies of scale, there will be synergies that will allow it to be accretive. So we don't necessarily have to, you know, freak out that uh, this company, I don't know if it's, you know, general, you know, throwing off $50 million a year in cash, if it's accretive to, you know, Microsoft or Procter Example and Gamble or Google or whoever it is, you know, it's still very attractive. Uh, but you also have to ask your question, solve the question, is it significant to potential buyers? So, you know, we'll use kind of like a simple example that most people can get, you know, because we're most familiar with consumer products companies, but you might have a great consumer product company and, you know, it's a really cool brand and you think that it's wonderful and people like it, you know, and the founder is able to get it to $10 million in annual revenue. Listen, anybody who can start a business from scratch and grow it to 10 million in annual, re annual revenue, you know, I am proud of you. You are a rock star. That is great. Pat yourself on the back. You've done a great job, but does that make it an investable business? No. And I'll tell you why is because these large, you know, multi-billion dollar potential acquirers, they're not really caring about, you know, adding 10 million in revenue to the bottom line. They're caring maybe about adding hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue to the bottom line. So think about, you know, will this grow large enough to be significant to the potential buyers who have enough cash to actually provide the returns that we need on this investment? Um, and then, you know, as a follow up to that too, you know, can it grow large enough to do a standalone IPO? I mean, generally a company needs to be pretty big uh, in order to be a candidate uh, for the public market. So, you know, we're looking same thing, kind of a billion dollar or more valuation to be able to raise a few hundred million dollars, at least in liquidity. Uh, another thing that can make it attractive and investable is, is the industry ripe for consolidation? So, you know, there are so many spaces where people are very, in, particularly in financial services sectors, where people are very interested in consolidating, right? So, you know, uh, I, I know one of the, the funds that we work with, they 
uh, you know, basically consolidate um, different payments platforms for people who do payments for different specific types of industries. So, you know, they had one company that does, you know, payments processing just for dry cleaners, you know, another one that might do it just for hair salons. So even if like your thing specifically maybe, you know, isn't the biggest thing in the world, if it's a component of an industry where there is active consolidation or you know there will be consolidation in the future, there's a great opportunity there for a potential exit that can be very valuable. Um, and then most importantly, though, they need to be well funded. So we look at the marketplace and we say, geez, you know, who are the people with the billions of dollars in cash and what are they looking to buy, right? And does this product or service, you know, or technology fit into that bucket of things that those people with all the money want to add to their portfolio? And by that, we mean, you know, is there late stage private equity interest? Uh, that can be a great way for you to, to achieve uh, liquidity and an exit as an investor. So um, I hope that that gives everybody sort of a good understanding of, you know, why exit is so important to investability and why if, you know, a startup's not investable, that doesn't mean that it's not a great company. You know, I, I as an investor, I mean, one of the things that really breaks my heart is when people, you know, come and pitch something to me and I'm like, you know, this sounds really great. You know, it's just not really a good fit for an investment. It's not to say that it's not a good business idea for you to do. It just means that, you know, from an investor perspective, it's not a great idea. And it breaks my heart on the other side when I see investors put money into things that are great business ideas, but they will end up kind of in what we call the land of the living dead, which is that the company, you know, will continue to operate for decades probably, and will probably pay the founder a really nice salary. But for you to actually get your money out in any meaningful way, is going to be nearly impossible, even though the business is, you know, successful, right? So we really need to operate by kind of a different standard of metrics uh, to achieve what we need to achieve. So let's talk a little bit about the seed round and the possible valuation methods. So, you know, we're going to go over this really briefly because these are just kind of some slides from um, our other presentation that more specifically goes into valuation. Um, and, you know, we have here benchmarks, Berkus method, and deferred valuation. We're not going to talk through these today. If you want to learn more, you can probably catch the recording on our YouTube channel of our valuations explained parts one and part two. But really what we are looking to use here is the venture capital method. And so it's very simple the way we want to think about this. Um, and of course, you know, you guys know my background is finance, so I'm all about you know, the Excel spreadsheets and doing all these calculations, and it's a little bit second nature to me. But really, the way that we think about it is we look at what the terminal sale value of a company is expected to be based on a multiple of sales or EBITDA. It's probably going to be sales, but it could be EBITDA, which is just, as you may know, a proxy for cash flow. Then we need to think about the total amount of equity capital to be invested in subsequent rounds, right? So, does this company need another 10 million to get to positive cash flow to get to sale? Or does it need another billion dollars before it gets to sale, right? The one that only needs 10 million is much more attractive than the one that needs another billion dollars. And so our IRR, right, internal rate of return, expected rate of return is calculated based upon this information, the exit value, right, the amount of dilution that we're gonna suffer, and then the number of years to exit. So we usually have about five years of projections to work with, but it usually will take five to 10 years to actually realize an exit. And so this is how we establish what our end valuation might be and what our IRR hurdles will be. And so for a company to be investable um, and to kind of support you know, raising money, it needs to be able to sort of follow what we call a clear capital strategy path. Right, and so this is more of what's appropriate for technology companies. Um, consumer companies operate a little bit differently. Obviously, biotech companies offer, operate very differently. Anything that's asset heavy will operate very diff differently. Um, but what we're really looking for is for the company to be able to say, you know, raise a pre-seed round of probably 250K to a million and be able to command a valuation of somewhere probably between three and $5 million, right? So they have to be able to support that. 
Then when they get to you for the seed round, let's say you're coming in at seed, they probably need to be able to raise between one and $3 million at a valuation of somewhere between four and $12 million, right? So in order to do that, they probably need to be somewhere between 20 and 100K in monthly recurring revenue. It doesn't have to be recurring, but we'll you know, sort of use a SaaS model here for this example. So when you invest there, what exactly is it that you're betting on, right? What's making it investable? Well, you know that the company's probably not gonna get, you know, to exit just on your 1 million. They will probably spend that money and they'll need to go raise more. So what needs to happen before they raise more money? Well, for them to, you know, credibly do a series A of say three to $10 million from the VCs, they probably need to be doing at least $100,000 in monthly recurring revenue or creating similar value, right, that's maybe not monetized uh, based on a user base or whatever metrics you might have for value. So for a com to be, company to be investable, they really need to be able to get to this point. And so that's why you'll see, you know, startups, usually solo founder startups who or maybe you know have a company that's doing twenty thousand dollars a month in revenue, which is great, right? That's a great little business, and they think, okay, great, I should go out and raise capital. Look how well I'm doing. Give me some more capital. But the problem is that it's not scalable enough for them to take that one million or whatever you're investing and to turn it into a hundred thousand a month. So not only do they have to turn it into a hundred thousand a month, but then once they get to that hundred thousand a month. Now the expectation is that they can turn it into, say, you know, at least $3 million a year in annual revenue so that they can do their Series B, right? And, you know, then it needs to get to kind of that $100 million in annual revenue, uh, you know, point for it to eventually be sold. So this is why we really need to be thoughtful around, you know, somebody can be doing a great job with a business, but there are these milestones that they kind of need to meet in order for the company to grow properly. And I've seen lots of founders who are very talented people uh, who've worked really hard and, you know, Sometimes it's through no fault of their own, right? They've been able to get a company to 20, 25K per month, but getting it to over 100K per month turns out to be very, very challenging. And, you know, the answer to why it didn't happen is usually because the business was not investable, probably for one of the many reasons, you know, that we went through earlier in the conversation. Um, so you need to just be really honest with yourself when you're making, you know, that decision. And this is part of the reason why, you know, service type businesses, consulting type businesses are not really considered investable, um, you know, or they're much riskier from an investability perspective. It's because it's very hard for them to break out into the higher annual revenue uh, uh, ranges where investors can actually get liquidity. So uh, this is just a slide that I really love, which sort of shows you, you know, a little bit of the range of valuations uh, between sort of idea all the way to growth stage at the early stage, kind of when companies are between three and say $15 million pre-money valuations um, before sort of big VC money comes in and, you know, what milestones really need to be achieved along that value evolution. Uh, so, you know, we're starting with idea, then we go to mock-up, then we go to MVP, pilots, first dollar revenue. And what I'm telling you guys is, you know, you can, you can play around down in that area and, you know, sometimes it makes sense, but really where you're going to, you know, capture the best risk adjusted return is right when they get to about product market fit. And I would say that usually at that point, you know, attractive valuations are somewhere in the seven to $12 million pre-money range, which is not that expensive, right? You can certainly be the one who got in there when it was a $3 million pre-money valuation and you were taking tons of risk. But you can, you know, sort of avoid all of this really, really risky area and position yourself a little bit better when you get to that product market fit inflection point. And so why is this so crucial for us as investors? Now, if you're here as an investor who's looking to build a portfolio, this is really our responsibility. So it's not the responsibility of the founder um, to present us with an investable deal. We as early stage investors play such a critical part of the capital ecosystem. And if we kind of like 
throw the money around willy nilly, um, it does not serve the economy, right? So you guys are all here because you've taken the initiative to educate yourself and to make really good decisions. Just as, you know, if the guys at Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan were like just kind of making crazy, you know, decisions around where they put their money and not investing it smartly, we wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't have a, this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful society that we live in with all of these nice things, right? And so it's the same thing for you as an early stage investor. You need to be really disciplined as to how you build your portfolio, because if you are not disciplined, you will eventually run out of money to invest in startups and our startup capital ecosystem will seize up. So I know it's a huge responsibility, uh, but I have faith in everybody and we can do it. And so why is this so important? Well, it's not that we don't expect anybody to fail because failure is part of life. It's part of success. And we know that probably a third of the companies, you know, that we invest in might completely go to zero. Uh, a third might end up, you know, kind of in that land of the living dead category where the company hasn't failed, but it's certainly not going to provide you an exit opportunity. Um, but then, you know, the last third should be the ones that actually will provide exit opportunities, will provide positive financial returns. And so if we look at this chart, you know, we look at three different investor portfolios, one that, you know, provides a 10% IRR, one that provides a 20% IRR, and one that provides an almost 30% IRR. And we really want to be in that 30% IRR bucket. And I will tell you that it is absolutely possible. Over the course of my investing career, I've averaged an IRR on investments unrealized of about 49%. And that's really where you want to be. And if you're very careful, you know, you should end up with a, a net IRR in this asset class of around 30%. But what needs to happen for you to actually achieve that? Well, you know, as you can see here, if we look at uh, deal outcomes that go from total loss to break even to a double, right? Some people are like, hey, a double, that's great. Like I doubled my money. It's not great. To a great exit, which is 10 x your money to a home run which is 20x we can see that for the first two portfolios which had you know sort of eight 40 percent total loss 40 percent break even a double and a great exit right i'm sure if any of you invest in a company that you know exited for 10 10x you'd be bragging to all your friends about how amazing uh you know astute of an investor you are only achieved a 10% return on the portfolio. So this means even though this person had, you know, one company in there that actually like did pretty well, they really under underperformed the markets. They almost sort of got a, you know, public equities market type return, which provides you with total liquidity. So why would you do that, right? And then in the second portfolio, which does a little bit better, this person actually had two companies in it that were 10 Xers. And they got to 20% IRR, which is, you know, good, but it's still not really meeting our hurdle rate. So as you can see for the third portfolio, which actually more meets that sort of 30%-ish hurdle rate that you're looking for, they had, uh, you know, 40% go to zero, three break even, uh, one double, one 10 Xer, and one 20 Xer. So you really do need to have companies in there that get to like 10 to 20 X uh, for your portfolio to really meet your risk adjusted return expectations. So the expectations need to be high. You know, if a, if a startup founder is coming to you saying, hey, you know what, this is gonna be like a three X in 10 years, no, that's not good enough. You need to know that that is not good enough. You know, they need to be telling you this is going to be a 30x in 10 years. Then you're like, okay, you know what? That will compensate me for my risk. And so this fun little math nerd chart just shows you a little bit about what, how IRRs change. Uh, and across the top bar, we have the, you know, multiple of invested capital upon exit. So anywhere from 2x to 20x. And then on the left-hand side, we have how long it takes to get there. So if somebody doubles your money, but it takes you them 10 years to do it, you're only going to be getting a 7% annual return, which is, you know, not really great, right? So that's not rewarding you for the risk uh, that you've undertaken. Um, so what we're really kind of looking for is, I would say, an average of about 10x, right? So if we go over to the 10x on the top bar within five years. So that is if you 
look at the intersection of 10x on top and five years on the side, you'll see it's about a 58% IRR. And this is what I generally estimate as the cost of capital for early stage businesses. Hopefully this company is expecting that your equity will be worth 10 times what it is now within five years. That really needs to be the hurdle. And if it's an even earlier stage one, you know, you're now looking at 20 or 30 uh, expectation. So we've talked a little bit about what sort of returns you need to require to build a healthy portfolio. We've talked a little bit about what the companies need to do, what the, you know, sort of surrounding, um, infrastructure of the you know uh, sector that they're in needs to look like the competitive landscape the acquirers right there are so many different people that are involved in you making this decision around is it investable or is it not investable but the last one where i see people make the biggest errors and particularly why you know i feel bad for people who are not 1000 angels members they're just like investing on some random website is the appropriate structuring, right? So the right security is everything. And then really being able to understand, you know, is it structured properly? Is the security done right? I've seen, you know, I've had people who are new members to a thousand angels who will, you know, send me some deal that they saw on, you know, some crowdfunding website and say, oh, hey, Erica, like this company looks really cool. They're doing like a wine of the month club. Like, should I invest? And I look at it and, you know, the security is like class B common shares, right? Just like some absolute fraudulent nonsense uh, that people are, you know, not noticing that, hey, you know, this is not the type of security that I should be in. So, you know, number one, when we're putting money into early stage companies, we don't buy common shares. So let's just, you know, right off the bat, let everybody know, you should not be investing in common shares. Um, you should probably not be investing in companies that are still set up as LLCs. You should make sure that it's uh, probably a Delaware C Corp or at least some sort of US C Corp set up as a C Corp and you're not getting common equity. Common equity is fine maybe for like friends and family or you know, people who are doing you know, work for the business. But if you are putting hard cold cash money into this business, you need to be in something that is more of an investor quality asset. So for pre-seed stage, and I'd say that this is generally like anything less than $2 million or maybe even less than $3 million rounds, people are typically going to use a convertible note or a safe. And safe stands for a simple agreement for future equity. Um, so a convertible note is technically debt. Okay. And so that's why the safe was created uh, because a convertible note is sort of written as a debt instrument, but it's really supposed to reflect an equity instrument. And that's why a lot of people prefer to use the safes not just because they are cheaper and easier uh, from a documentation perspective, but also because they more accurately, accurately reflect what you're really buying, which is equity in the company. You should also completely realize that when you invest in a, even if it's a convertible note for a startup, do not expect that you're going to get paid back. You would only get paid back in a situation where um, the equity suddenly became very valuable, the note was not structured properly, and they just want to buy you out of your position on the cheap. So, you know, a convertible note is not really a debt instrument, um, and so you should not be thinking of that it that way. But it is a loan that converts into the next priced round of equity, and the safe, simple agreement for future equity also does that. And so it will typically have a valuation cap Right. And so that what that means is there'll be a maximum price per share at which it will convert into equity or it will have a discount to the next round. So if when the company actually raises a qualified financing of equity, say the price per share is ten dollars and you have a 20 percent discount, you would convert in at eight dollars a share, a little bit less than the follow on investors. And there will always sort of be events triggering the conversion. Each one is sort of documented differently. But what it kind of allows you to do is defer valuation uh, issues. But more importantly, it allows you to very inexpensively execute a pseudo equity instrument. Uh, and the reason this is important is because doing an actual preferred equity security issuance can cost, you know, Fifty to hundred thousand dollars. So if you're only raising, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you clearly don't want to waste your money that way. Um, as the companies get more mature and do 
larger rounds and do a true seed round of equity, you'll have what you call participating or straight preferred equity. And so what these are are real priced equity instruments that whoever participated in the pre-seed round will convert into, or if you're a new investor in this round, you will actually receive this as your equity shares. Now, it's very important that you have some sort of preferred equity and you do not have common shares because what it does is it differentiates the fact that you purchased your equity with cash versus other people on the cap table who earned it with sweat equity. And what that kind of gives you the right to do is that if there is any liquidation of cash or assets coming out of the business, you are entitled to first be made whole, your original investment, before anyone else with common shares begins to share in the spoils of the liquidation. So this is really, really cr crucial. Don't invest in common. Always make sure that you are in some sort of preferred and that can be participating or it can be straight preferred. I will just say that I'm not gonna talk too much about participating preferred right now. I've done it in the other videos because also I haven't seen a participating preferred deal happen in probably 12 years. Uh, they might come back, but you know we haven't seen them in a while, uh, but they were great while they were around. So I wanna just answer a question from Matthew who asks, will convertible notes and safes convert into preferred shares or common shares or does it depend on the specific? So they will, convert into preferred shares. Um, they're going to convert into whatever the security is in the next qualified financing. So, you know, when the next, when the company does their next raise, right, they raise a $3 million series A, um, it's, there's almost a 0% chance that, you know, the lead investor is going to be like, let's do this in common shares. If they did for some reason, I mean, yes, you would be screwed. It would convert into common shares, um, but you know, nobody's going to do that, right? Every real investor who's putting real money into a deal usually knows that it should be uh, preferred equities. So it will convert into whatever the form of equity of the next um, issuance is, which will probably be preferred. So you should be good, but just make sure that you read the language, you know, and this is one of the reasons why I really just discourage startups from using convertible notes um, because convertible notes are not really like completely standard versus a safe, which is an instrument created by Y Combinator is pretty much completely off the shelf standard. And it's also written in plain English. So it's very easy to understand. Whereas once you let, you know, a lawyer get at a convertible note, they can make all sorts of crazy changes, you know, put in weird language that's going to confuse you and confuse the issue and can even end up putting you into a bad situation. So you should end up in preferred equity. Uh, what you will get is something called shadow preferred. And it's the same thing as the preferred that the new investors are getting. Uh, it just sort of, if you convert it in at that discount or at that valuation cap, right, at some sort of a lower price, it's going to reflect the fact that, you know, hey, when we look at the liquidation preference, this person didn't pay a dollar for her share. She paid 80 cents or she paid 50 cents, right? So that would be her liquidation preference. So that's really the only difference. If you hear, you know, shadow preferred, don't get terribly confused by it, um, but you probably will convert into that class of stock. So if we look at preferred, what that means is that you're going to receive a return of capital and dividends prior to any distribution to holders of the common shares, right? We want to be in that. And then what participating means is that the participating for preferred people, they're able to get their money back plus their dividends, and then they convert the entire thing into equity. With just straight preferred, you know, you either get your money back and the dividends or you convert into equity. So it's either or, which is less valuable than sort of the participating, which is this nice little double dip, which as I said, I haven't seen in a while. And then the liquidation preference means that you are going to receive X times your capital back before distributions are made to common shareholders. So liquidation preferences have not been greater than one also, I would say in about 10 or 12 years. Uh, so usually when we say a liquidation preference, it's one times and it just means that you're entitled to get your investment back before any other distributions are made. In bad markets where capital is scarce, liquidation preferences can be 2x. 
They can be 3X, they can be more than that. I mean, technically they can be whatever, but I have seen them in very capital constrained environments go to two or three, which means that the investor needs to get paid back two or three times their investment before any distributions are made to common shareholders. The only reason to sort of think about this is if for whatever reason um, a company has raised money with a high liquidation preference security, it clearly disincentivizes, disincentivizes the founders because the founders basically have to like double or triple that money before they even get anything, right? So that's why it's considered sort of not, you know, wonderful to use because it really sort of does mess up the capitalization structure a bit. Um, so I want to thank everybody so much. And I think I got to all the questions. Yeah, I got to all the questions. I want to thank you guys so much for joining today, for being so attentive and so wonderful. If you would like to learn more about early stage investing and how you can build your portfolio intelligently in really great companies in direct investments, not in ridiculous SPVs that are taking a bunch of carried interest and whatnot, uh, I'd love for you to visit 1000angels.com. You can sign up for a free two week trial membership at any time. Uh, it is for accredited investors only. So make sure that you are accredited. And that doesn't mean passing any, you know, exams or anything like that. You just need to meet an income and asset test to make sure that it's suitable for you. And if you're not there yet, you know, still follow along. I know that you'll all be in that category at one time and you'll all be, uh, you know, really excited to make great startup investments with me. So, uh, you know, just keep watching the videos and, you know, hopefully we'll invite you into the fold one of these days. Uh, if you are ready to start investing and you are an accredited investor, sign up for your trial membership and I will uh, schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with you to explain the benefits of investing with 1000 Angels. So thank you guys so much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Bye.